Hi, Julie Cielo here with Hannah Crum of Kombucha Camp, an online store and educational program all about kombucha. And I'm so excited to be joining her here in her home in Los Angeles today, learning about what is kombucha. So the, the fermentation, the kombucha mama, tell us, what is kombucha? Absolutely, Julie. Well, uh, kombucha, as you know, is fermented tea. Uh, ferment, so we can ferment all kinds of things. Oftentimes, like sauerkraut is fermented cabbage and... Um, uh, wine is fermented grapes, beer is fermented grain, kombucha is fermented tea. So uh, just like all these other fermentation processes, by subjecting the tea to a fermentation culture, it then brings out the health benefits and the bioavailability of the nutrients already present in the tea. So mm. it's basically like making tea and then supercharging it, so it's even healthier for you. Wow, that's really interesting. So uh, what exactly is a SCOBY? Great question. So SCOBY is our mother culture. Um, this is an acronym that was developed by Len Porzio back in the 90s when everyone was talking about kombucha. They couldn't tell, did you mean kombucha the beverage or kombucha the culture? So uh, on this listserv, they're like, hey, why don't we come up with a word for it? Something like SCOBY, which stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. Mm -hmm. The name stuck. <laughs> and so this is there are many types of fermentation cultures we would consider a SCOBY, but the name was specifically developed for kombucha to refer to the kombucha culture. Is that what these are here? These yes. pancake looking. Um, so these are actually, these are actually live. This is the mother. These are live in here, and you can see that they're layered like pancakes. And um, so the bacteria is the white part. They create the cellulose structure, and then the brown strands that you see depending is the yeast. So whenever you get a bottle of kombucha from the grocery store and there's strands in there, what exactly is that in the bottle? So the really terrific thing about fermented foods is they are literally infinite abundance in process. So kombucha is such a vibrant dynamic fermentation that even when it's in the bottle, even in the refrigerator section, it will still grow a culture and it's still live. Exactly right. It's and that's amazing. one of the that's one of the ways we can tell that the bottle of kombucha we're drinking is alive is because it has some of those bits in there. Now, not everybody likes to drink the bits. I personally consider it like an oyster shooter, just chuck the whole thing back, a little extra dose of my probiotics. I like to pretend they're sea monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Because they kind of look like they're they're swimming around and they're yeah, like little monkeys. Exactly. But right. there I was really into sea monkeys as a kid. Um, so I know that there's a difference between kombucha and jun. A lot of people have asked me, what is the difference between kombucha and jun, and where did they originate? What is some of the history behind those two <clears throat> cultures? Absolutely. So um, kombuchas and juns and most fermented foods origins are continue to be shrouded in mystery. For the most part, we don't exactly know where these things came from, but the great thing is, is that our ancestors hundreds if not thousands of years ago recognize their value and continue to propagate and pass them down. So um, kombucha's origins are most likely Chinese originally because it is tea and that is where tea comes from. Right. And then it spread all over the world primarily to the rest of Asia, Japan, Korea, and Russia where it's become very much a beloved beverage mm -hmm. there. And from Russia it also made its way into Europe. So it's been incredibly popular in Germany and France, Italy, there's been songs written about it. Wow. And a lot of this great information is going to be included in our book coming out in November. Oh, how exciting. Yes. The history of kombucha so and good. so much more. That's right. Is, um, is it true that Jun culture came from Tibet? You know, we don't really know that. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, in my cursory look at the literature, you know, I don't speak Tibetan. <laughs> but in what I've tried to look for in terms of what's the word for fermented? Is there a word for fermented tea? Uh, unfortunately, I've not come across anything very definitive. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be that the John and kombucha culture are related because they do have very similar characteristics. And the one defining feature that distinguishes the two, um, if you were to narrow it down to just one, is that kombucha is tea and sugar and John is tea and raw honey. Mm -hmm. Now, currently the thought process is green tea and raw honey, but just like kombucha was originally thought to be only made with black tea, but now we make it with black tea, green tea, white tea, Herba mate, I've exactly. seen. Exactly. In the store. So I'm confident that jun can also be made with other types of teas and herbals, but the primary 
distinguishing characteristic is that raw, unpasteurized honey because the bacteria present in that honey interacts with the bacteria in the culture and that's what makes it so different. Oh, I love Jen. Jen is my absolute favorite and I bought my culture from oh. Hannah and I make my own rose Jen um, mm. that I make for friends and it's just one of my favorite elixirs. Um, so thank you for introducing me to Jen, Hannah. Um, so I know that you know a lot about kombucha and you're quite an authority not just in teaching people how to make kombucha but also uh, what's happening commercially with kombucha, isn't that right? That's true. Um, in fact, in 2014, we co-founded Kombucha Brewers International. Wow. It's a non-profit trade association dedicated to promoting and protecting the commercial kombucha industry here in the United States and worldwide. Well, I saw your museum. Or have to multiple, take a look. <laughs> multiple museums of many different kombuchas that are out on the market here in our home. It's amazing how many uh, companies are out there uh, making kombucha for, for lots of different people. Well, we have so. over 50 members, like I said, from all around the world. Um, not, you know, several here in the United States. Many are small, local, regional. Some mm -hmm. are kind of expanding into a larger area, and others are also trying to become national brands. But we also have brands represented from Canada, Costa Rica, Martinique. Wow. So wow. Um, kombucha is certainly picking up all over the place. And I forgot to mention Australia, which is Hot, hot, hot. If you are in Australia, kombucha is just blowing up like crazy. And that is so awesome. Well, there must be so, I mean, your skin is gorgeous. <laughs> I have to say, you, whatever you're doing, it's working for you. But um, just curious, what are some of the other health benefits to drinking kombucha? Because I know some people are confused about the sugar that actually mm. is put in the kombucha that the that the uh, SCOBY's eating, um, it being um, in their body and actually affecting candida, autoimmune, other things. So could you speak on that a little bit? Absolutely. And um, you are hitting on, on something that a lot of people bring up as a confusion point, which is, well, there's sugar in kombucha. Sugar's bad for me. Doesn't that mean kombucha is bad for me? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, the sugar is not for you. The sugar is for the culture. So if you ever taste your sweet tea before you add that culture, you will know that it tastes totally different than the end product. Right. Because the sugar is feeding the fermentation process. And that's why it's important we use sugar and not stevia or other non-fermentable sugars. Right. Now we can always experiment, and we recommend you do that with your extra SCOBY. So go ahead and make a, you know, agave kombucha or whatever you want. Uh, molasses, maple syrup. Um, so back to your original question about the health benefits. Yeah. You mentioned my skin. That certainly. So kombucha is something that cleans the body from the inside out. Every day we are consuming things. We're putting products on our body. We're exposed to um, pollution from the air, from the water, from everywhere. And our body is like a sponge. It's just soaking up all these toxicants. And if we don't have a way to release those from our body, they can build up and throw us out of balance, as we see in things like candida, where we have normally a, a, a yeast that is naturally present in our gut. Because typically of antibiotic use, it's allowed to get out of balance, and it creates a lot of um, health issues for the people who have this, this uh, dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. And what it'll do, unfortunately, is it'll tell you to eat sugar because those bacteria want to live. Exactly. And that's how they must die, is removing the sugar, correct? Well, removing the sugar and also exposing them to bacteria that will outcompete that right, with them. the good guys. And that kombucha has those good guys. So kombucha, and there's many other fermented foods out there that also have good guys. So, um, you know, kombucha may not be right for you right away. And this is where listening to your body, trusting your gut, right. is different from my gut, is different from somebody else's gut. You have to listen to your body. Now, of course, that's difficult if you're already in a healing crisis because mm -hmm. your body is giving you all kinds of signals. So it's really just being at peace with that. Taking the kombucha in first thing in the morning is how we recommend it, four to eight ounces on an empty stomach. And then just feel how the kombucha works in your system. And if you feel supported by the kombucha, then you should drink more of it. If you feel like it's it's not very supportive for you, then maybe you shouldn't have it right now. Have something like kefir, milk mm -hmm. kefir, water kefir, help repair your gut and then add the kombucha back in when your body gives you the, the sign that it's good. Right. Now, specific to candida is many candida sufferers will have to go through a die-off period before they heal. Right. And so it can often feel like, oh, I'm drinking kombucha, but it's jacked all my symptoms up. Well, that's the toxins leaving your body. Those bacteria and yeast didn't get there in one day, and they're not going to go without a fight. Right. And so you have to kind of gauge, is this a die-off that I'm experiencing, 
or is this an exacerbation of symptoms that's not getting better? Right. Typically, within about two weeks, people will kind of see those symptoms abate if they are going through that die-off period. Now, of course, we're not doctors. We're not giving any medical advice here. We're just simply telling you what other people have experienced and encouraging you to try it for yourself and just listen to your own body to see how it responds. Oh, I know from my own personal experience, having been sick with a debilitating autoimmune disease back in 2001, I wasn't able to touch anything like kombucha for about a year and a half after being ill. And certainly, I mean, I'm promoting fermented cocktail mixes now, so you, if you were ill, you probably wouldn't want to be adding vodka to a <laughs> fermented beverage and taking it when ill. So we know that there are stages, staging stages process, of healing. And, and you need to start. So that was really, I think, a really great recommendation to even start with the water keeper, mm. uh, which I know that you have so many different resources on your website, kombuchacamp.com, including some recipes for cocktails, kombucha which cocktails. I love talking about. So, um, Well, let's what quickly do you talk here? about um, why fermented cocktail mixers are so good for us. Okay. Um, you know, in this country, we've kind of forgotten the role that alcohol has played historically out, throughout our, you know, hundreds of thousands of existence, and that is as a medicine. Right. Um, and the reason it's able to do that is alcohol thins our blood. It allows for the absorption of that nutrition more easily. And so whenever we infuse herbs and things, these are original cough syrups and tinctures and things like that. Back you know, you smell a Jägermeister and you're like, oh, that smells terrible. But probably the herbs it was made out of was a very a powerful medicinal blend. You're not supposed to drink a gallon of that, right? And not a gallon. Right. See, this is the thing. It's about balance, right? You don't drink a gallon of cough syrup. Or if you do, you probably don't feel that great afterwards. Um, so... Balance moderation. Everything in moderation, including moderation, which means sometimes you get drunk. But sometimes <laughs> you don't drink anything at all. you got to take a break. Right, right. But having balance. fermented um, fermented drinks with our alcohol, oftentimes those fermented beverages have, especially in the case of kombucha, they're higher in B vitamins. Oftentimes they help protect the liver. In the case of kombucha, there are certain healthy acids created that definitely um, help eliminate toxins from the liver. And there's been quite a bit of research showing the hepatoprotective uh, powers of kombucha. So if you uh, get on Google Scholar and uh, put that in on kombucha, you'll find some great research information. So if you're a healthy individual, it could be a very balanced and healthy cocktail to combine kombucha with some sort of liquor. I've done that myself whenever I've been out of mixers at home um, before I launched Perm Fatal. I've taken Jun and mixed it with vodka. Mm. And I have to say, like, it's it's brilliant. So I can't wait to see well, some Well, and you of... minimize your hangover. Yes. So if I go out to a bar and they don't have kombucha on tap, I'm, bar I'm drinking one cocktail and that's it. That's right. my limit because otherwise it's too much for my body. If they have kombucha cocktails available, now I'm ordering more than one. So uh, <laughs> how fun. anyone out there who's got a bar is a good idea to have your kombucha because you'll allow people to continue the party for longer. Well, speaking of continuing the party, <laughs> Hannah makes... Hannah makes all of her own kombuchas here in-house, and I'm looking at four of her creations that are very exciting, and I can't wait to taste. I've already had some samples of her fruit leather that she dries scobies, and um, I think that's just brilliant. Um, but what is Love Potion number 99? A uh, Love Potion 99 is one of my favorite flavors. It's blueberry, lavender, and rose. Mm. And um, I've always approached flavoring my kombucha from a more holistic perspective. So I use whole blueberries. They're frozen. That's easy. Um, I also use la uh, lavender flowers and rose petals. So yes. instead of doing oils, which some people do, I tend I find I really like that the way the flavor um, makes that happen. So that's here, good we have to know. A little sip of I this? think we should have a little sip. It's almost Valentine's. So this is just. Freshly in the bottle, so there's not a lot of fizz built up yet. But we will get to try the taste. And then we'll try some of the others and see how they compare. Cheers. So you all Cheers. Mmm. It's delish. So this is made with green or black tea? It's made with Hannah's special tea blend, ah. which of course you can find at kombuchacamp.com, camp with a K at our I've store. I've used that blend before for my for my Jun, and it's amazing. 
Yes, it's a blend of green tea, black tea, white tea, rooibos, and yerba mate, all blended for flavor and health benefits. It's also How really great. Fun. Oh. I don't think there's anyone out in the market producing kombucha with all of those teas together, are they? Um, you know, most producers just keep it simple. They maybe have one or two teas that they blend together, but some people, that's what they're all about is the tea. So that's what's really great about all the different kombucha companies is they all have a different kind of philosophy and ethos. So some of them will only produce kegs because they want to reduce the, the um, you know, the fingerprint of their business. Right. Some brands um, only flavor with the tea, so they'll use like some kind of fruity tea to create the flavor, and others, you know, flavor afterwards. So you get a whole variety. Some are sour, some are sweet, some are sparkly, some are flat. Ooh.